When I first started learning game development, all the code I was writing, I was actually writing for the first time. And because of that, there was a lot of learning and mistakes and growth. But over the last four and a half years, I've realized there's a bunch of scripts out there that I kind of use in every one of my games. And as someone who has dyslexia, I understand that the learning process is different for everybody. For me, it was spelling and reading were always something that was very challenging for me. But for you, it could be programming. So I wanted to share with you today about a handful of these scripts I use in almost all of my games. And I'm hoping by explaining their use case for you and, and kind of walking through why I use them and how I use them, I might unlock some of the ways that you might want to do game development because at the end of the day how you learn game development is entirely up to you and what you do in your games there's no best way of doing it but it's going to be what works best for your brain and by figuring that out you'll unlock this capability to jump into that flow state and i guarantee given enough time enough dedication enough mistakes you too will have a game that's published over on steam or whatever platform you want to do it on so let's dive right into the very first script and that is my global script so this global script is something I can access from anywhere in my game. And to understand all of these scripts moving forward, you're gonna have to know that you can go and you can actually have scripts that are globally accessible. So you click on project, project settings, go over to the global tab here, and then you can click in here and grab a script or a scene that you want to load across your project. These will be loaded when the game launches. And then to access them, you will can go and type in the name. So in this case, I would do global and then the variable or the method I wanted to call from that from any script inside of my game, which is super powerful. Um, and then the only thing I would note is that the order of operation here is important. This will be the order they load in. So if you have a script which is relying on another global script, you just need to make sure that it's higher up in that category than the other. So you can click and drag them around or you can move them around with these arrows like so. The global script, from a basic standpoint, my use case is it is my high level area where I put various singletons that I wanna access across the board. So in this case, I have a card manager class, which handles loading in the data for my various cards in my, in my game Hexagod into the project. And that is gonna be accessible from the global script. And it's something that just loads once at the beginning of the game. And then I have that information ready to go. So I'm not reloading all of this data and reparsing this data. There's gonna be one moment when this all starts up that reloads that all into memory. Another really good use case would be having my RNG class up here, you know, which is the random number generator, because I want to have one instance of my RNG so that if I ever do want to have a specific seed setting, I could have the player put in seed one, two, three, four, five, and then that seed would be useful across all of my game. So whenever I ever do any sort of randomness, I always do global.rng and then call one of the, um, the RNG methods from the uh, random number generator class. Another cheeky thing I'll do is because I usually only have single scene class, this is my main scene here is what I name all my main scenes. I will also have a global reference in my global class to main and on ready in main, I will simply then call global dot main equals self, which is set on ready here, global dot main equals self. And then anywhere in my project, I can access the root node, whether I'm adding child children to it or accessing one of my many on ready variables, which is going to be used for housing various things that are part of my game. So it's a little cheeky. It, uh, it might run into some problems, but so far it's actually been pretty nice for me to, to do that. So that is, the, that is the global class. That is something I use in every game. And the next class I wanna talk about is gonna be my signal bus class. That is again, this is another auto load class. And, and the main thing this does is it gives me globally available signals. Signals are great. You can connect to them. And when a signal is emitted, you can run some logic. So a really good example here is going to be my spawning state. So whenever my spawning state changed, I emit a signal passing out some, some data. And then I have things like this node here, which will grab and say signal bus dot spawning state change the name of the signal dot connect. And then I say the method I want to connect it to. And then there's some logic based off the data I'm passing in, which I've defined as this small little data wrapper. You can pass that data in and then this connected signal, this connected method here will run and do some specific logic based off that signal. Two quick warnings about the signal bus. Not everything has to be done in this signal bus. So if you have things that it's like a, a child and a parent connecting your custom signal together, it doesn't need to necessarily be housed here because this is gonna be like global things where 
Many different areas might be emitting the signal or many different things might be consuming the signal. This can be your kind of one-stop shop for defining some of those signals. The other warning about signals in general is Godot does not guarantee the order of execution. So if you need something that has a specific order like A has to happen before B has to happen before C, you're gonna wanna have a more like a, a global method that says, hey, you do this, then you do this, then you do this, instead of saying, emit a signal and have those things happen. Signals are great if you don't care about the order and you just want stuff to update accordingly, but if you need that tight couple order, signals might not be the right choice for you. But signal buses are great. I highly recommend you check them out. They might be very useful for your projects. If you wanna support my work any further, I do not take sponsorships, but instead you can go check out Hexagod. You can play the demo right now and give me feedback and help me make this game as good as possible. If you wanna do financial support as well, Chess Survivors is a super fun game. It's currently on sale because it's part of the Raid Survivor Festival for about $2.50. I appreciate all the support you've given me. The channel's growing. It's super cool. Let's get back into it. The next script I use in almost all of my projects is a utility auto load script. I call it util because it's just a bit easier to and quicker to write since I'm calling it all over my project. And the main thing I do with this is I house all of my enums because they're that freaking good. Enums are the bones of my project. They are the things that keep my data consistent across the board. So for example, if I have a resource type and it's food and I want the food to be used in a bunch of different places like UI or heck in managing a resource about how much food do I have? How much food does a villager eat? I can make sure because I have an enum defined, I'm talking about the same food. I'm using the same color, the same texture across the board. And that is super, super useful. So because of that today, I'm announcing I'm starting the cult of the enum. If you like to join it you can join the discord or the mailing list i'm just kidding we're not we're not actually starting an enum uh an enum cult and we're not good in general is not a cult we're not a cult okay you know we're not a cult it's fine anyways the utility script yeah enums it's got has a bunch of constants or methods that i'll be using across the board you could also reasonably throw these into that previously defined global or game game script but in my head it just is nice to separate them out to say global is going to be more like functional stuff and this is going to be a little bit less functional a little bit more like static stuff that i want to be able to call from and and really access those enums from all over my project to go along with the utility script i have now recently started using a reference scene which has a script attached to it with a bunch of export variables so I can set things and not make them be magic strings. So I used to have a utility script full of a bunch of colors with hexadecimal values, but my brain doesn't think in hexadecimal. So having these exports, I can see the colors and the actual values I want. And I could use this thing to fine tweak the HSV and kind of move things around accordingly and then access this from a global value um, from anywhere because it is that auto load script. And something really nice about those enums that I tie back into again here, because enums are so great, is I can say get resource type by color or get resource color by type, pass in the enum and return out the color. So I can also do that for textures or even having packed scenes that I wanna just easily load from all over the place. And then if I ever move my file tree around over there, none of these references break and stuff like that. So I'm not sure I'm gonna use this in the future and maybe this doesn't have to be a node, maybe it can be custom resource, but it's actually been pretty nice in Hexagod. So it'd be something I'd recommend you checking out as a way to pair with your utility script. Could be a good way to have those colors be globally available, have some icons globally available, and make sure that if you're referencing, you know, your food resource across the board, the colors are consistent and the textures are consistent. And this has been actually a pretty good solution for that. The next script I add to all my projects is called a scene changer, and it's actually attached to a auto load or globally loaded um, scene, which is something you can actually do, which is super cool. And the main thing this is doing is it is it has an animation player and it, it takes the color rect, which is part of a layer, and will just do a quick fade to a color and then fade out as it calls uh, in this method on the animation player, the actual change scene. The, the code itself is pretty simple. You can call a change scene from anywhere, passing in an enum, because enums are so good, remember, and then have a match statement on that enum. In this case, if it was a game passed in, it would change it to the game path, start that animation player, and then when this new scene is called, it'll call get tree .call deferred change scene to file, and change it to that path. So a simple little um, layer that's added to the whole project. I made sure the layer was 100, so it's always gonna be on the very top of the project unless I have something higher ordering than 100, but right now, I don't have any plans for that, so future me can deal with that if they run into it. But a very nice quality of life uh, scene that I've started to, scene and script that I've started to load and add to all my projects. Another script and an auto load that I've been messing with in my last few projects has been an audio manager. And the goal of this was to handle the situation where you have a bunch of different nodes, kind of like, say they're XP 
um, nodes that get sucked up when a player gets near them. And when they get to the player, they all play a sound effect, like a little bing noise. If you have a bunch of those XP nodes that kind of all con converge at once and play that audio at once, it'll blow the top end of the audio um, and it kind of sounds really bad. And my my reasoning that this happened is because it happened in Chess Survivors and I built that project back when I didn't understand that I could do something like this. And essentially from a very high level, um, this project, what it does is it creates the audio and it keeps track using an audio effect setting, which is another class that says, hey, do we have a limit? They say the limit's five. If we have open limit, let's go ahead and create it because maybe we've only spawned four of them at this moment. And so we'll spawn that fifth one. But if we want to spawn a sixth one and the others are still playing, their noise don't spawn that extra one but at the end of the audio when it's finished we'll go ahead and decrement that count back down so that we freed up space for new audio effects to come in as i was recording this i realized this is a much deeper and more interesting um, auto load script so if you want to see a video diving into how i do this audio manager some of the pros and cons and kind of more of the finite how this code works leave a comment below and i'll be sure to make that video in the coming weeks if you know anything about me, it's that I love hexagons. And so I'm finally making a commercial game called Hexagod, which has hexagons in it. But I've made a bunch of small games over the years with prototyping, which are using basically the backbone of all of my hexagon stuff has been a hexagon utility class based off of this hexagon grids blog entry by Red Blob Games. This is such a great resource. I highly recommend you read through it. It'll make your brain understand how to make your own um, kind of hexagon grid maps. And to pair with that, I've gone ahead and created a, a hexagon utility class over here in Godot, which I've basically brought forward to all of my various projects and has all of the kind of methods that I've transposed and translated from um, this uh, this document into GDScript. So there is also going to be a GitHub link below to this utility class that you can pull down. And the only thing I will say is that there is a method inside of here. Uh, when you instantiate it, you have to pass in a cell size. And the cell size has to be set based off of the size of texture you're using. So it's something I've always had to kind of guess and check on the correct cell size. There's probably some math that you could figure out based off of your pixel sizes and stuff like that of what that correct size should be. But just guess and check and you can figure it out. So that, all those links will be below. And that's it. Those are all the scripts that I use in almost all of my projects. So I hope something there sparks some interest in you. Maybe something you could try new. And just remember, this shit's hard. Making games is really challenging. I feel lost all of the time, but I've had the most success if I just start moving in any direction and learn if that's the right direction. Stick with it, and I promise, given enough time, dedication, learning, and so, so many mistakes, too many bugs to count, you too will have a game out there that just barely works, but is fun, and your players will love it. I've been Aramis. Good luck out there. You're better at this than you think. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.